session. Uh, this we are to begin. Uh, this session is about the energy planning. Uh, we have four papers, uh, different uh, issues, but very interesting. And uh, I I think that there will be a very interesting uh, uh, task to to speak with, between us. Uh, the presentations uh, will be for 20 minutes, more or less. Eh? Five minutes before the, the end, I will advise. And five minutes plus five minutes uh, to make questions, to, to discuss the discussion. But uh, I will be flexible. We have two hours. Uh, no, until uh, 10 o'clock. And I will try to... Uh, that the time will be on time. Okay. Uh, the first uh, paper is from uh, uh, Elmar Thorman. is uh, speaking about uh, behavioral uh, changes and patterns of supply and, uh, and demand in Germany. Uh, I give you the floor, uh, Elmar. Thank you very much. Um, and I will start sharing my screen. I hope you can all see that, um, but it worked just some seconds ago, so it should It's ideally... very well. Yeah, not a problem, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so, um, well, welcome from me uh, also, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to present today um, a student research project, project from last winter term at TU Berlin in Germany. And the uh, research project had the title um, of had the title the potential of sufficiency measures to achieve a fully renewable energy system as a case study for Germany. So this um, well this research project has been carried out by all the people you can see on this slide. So I'm just a represent, represent representative of uh, all the people here. So to um, dive right in and as a motivation. So we have the underlying problem of the climate crisis. And at least in Germany, we have a, a, growing, um, a growing pressure from the civil society, especially from the young civil society, which, uh, um, which kind of puts pressure on science and policies to decarbonize the energy system within a given uh, time frame. And at least for Germany, um, nuclear power as an option for decarbonization, the energy system for decarbonizing the energy system is ruled out politically. Um, so this means we have to find other ways to decarbonize the energy system. And of course there has been a lot of decarbonization literature uh, on national and international scale. Um, but what we found in our literature research so far was that um, the literature widely focuses um, either on negative emissions, for example, through um, carbon capture, transport, and storage, uh, as in case of the uh, last IPCC report. Um, for Germany, we also have um, now hydrogen, like this is quite recent, this was published last year, the National Hydrogen, hydrogen Strategy has something like the silver bullet uh, to decarbonize the energy system. So there's a lot of hype about hydrogen now at the moment. And on the demand side, um, we have a huge focus in literature on energy efficiency. Um, so what, what we saw in, in this literature um, was that there's a, like, there's a huge focus on technical supply side solutions. And on the demand side, the focus is on efficiency. But a lot of energy system models, especially, and we applied in energy system models uh, model uh, focuses on either uh, yeah, supply side solution or efficiency and mostly neglects behavior. So we wanted to look at sufficiency. Um, so behavioral changes, human behavior in energy system modeling. So um, starting from this, we uh, would, or I would like to first um, give a short definition of sufficiency, how we looked at it uh, within this work. So um, you, you, you could think like this, this bar chart uh, hopefully um, helps to facilitate an understanding of what sufficiency really is. So um, if you look at this bar chart, you could see in the darkish blue um, 
bar the initial demand of uh, 100%, and then uh, it can be differentiated between three pillars or three different ways of decarbonizing this energy demand. So consistency would mean, um, for example, replacing fossil fuels by renewables. Efficiency, probably all of you know this term, it means improving the input output ratio and sufficiency would mean um, consuming less energy actually. So if you would like to look at these concepts in one word, consistency would be different from today, efficiency would be better and sufficiency would mean less energy consumption. So um, I understand this is, that this is how, quite like a wide field and the definitions of sufficiency in literature are also really uh, well different and wide and they rank from more abstract overhead concepts of something like a sufficiency donuts um, where the inner circle would represent basic human needs and the outer circle planetary boundaries and in between something like a safe operating space for sufficient energy services. So you could think of it that way, but um, we decided for this paper that we want, uh, we, we want to have like more concrete um, definition of sufficiency. So we defined it as the reduction of energy consumption to a level where benefit is not significant, sig significantly diminished, sorry. Um, so I also understand that uh, a level where benefit is not significantly diminished is a highly debatable term, but we will also catch up on this later in the discussion. Uh, and so based, well, based on this concept of sufficiency, um, we uh, defined our research question for this um, project and which will also guide us through the following presentation. What is the potential of sufficiency-based demand reductions and what impacts do they have on the supply side of a 100% renewable energy system in Germany? So what we did in general, we started um, to determine the potential of energy demand reductions based on literature. We did that by identifying measures, political instruments to um, reduce the absolute energy demand or at least to promote um, uh, 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 like a, a decreased use of energy, a sufficient energy use. And we tried to translate that to potentials. So meaning we quantified it. And these potentials we used as an input to uh, energy system model. Um, it's a linear least cost capacity expansion model. And we did that for uh, two scenarios, a high ambition and a low ambition scenario and a sectoral sensitivity, but uh, this will be clearer later in this presentation. So um, what is, so the general, I think the, the overall um, approach would be looking at the demand side, determining the potential, using that as an input for an energy system model to um, estimate the impacts that uh, these demand side reductions could have on the supply side and how they could potentially contribute to facilitating a 100% renewable energy system. So we, we, we use several indicators um, for that, for example, total si system cost savings, renewable capacity reductions, storage reductions, and also the sectoral differences. Um, so coming, well, before we come to the, um, to the uh, potential demand reductions, um, a quick overview on the demand data that we used. So this is something like our reference starting point. Um, so we have for Germany a total of 1,465 terawatt hours of energy demand. This is mostly consistent of electricity and some hydrogen. So uh, we have 54% uh, of this coming from the heat sector, 26% from the mobility sector, and 20% from the conventional electricity. So this is the starting point uh, of our demand data. Um, of course, in the more like in a, in a, in a, in a um, more detailed temporal resolution, we had time series. Um, but we then looked uh, at all the three sectors and looked at measures uh, on how to, or what would be sound assumptions or political instruments that could promote uh, sufficient energy behavior that would lead to uh, um, a decreased energy use. So this is for mobility. Um, this is quite uh, comprehensive, uh, but I think we could pick out one, um, one measure to illustrate our approach. So for example, um, 
if you can look at the road passenger, the one day of home office. So what we did there is we looked at um, German statistics, how much passenger road uh, transport is related to commuting to work. And then we assumed um, based on other literature in this field that on average one day of home office might be possible in Germany. And so we said that the share of passenger road transport that is related to commuting would be um, reduced by 20%. So doing this for all the measures that you can see in this table, uh, we came up with this potential for the mobility sector. Um, we have here our reference demand in mobility of uh, 375 terawatt hours. And then we have in the, uh, in the, in the right and the rightest uh, bar chart, the low and high ambition reduction potential in more lighter blue. So we're coming up with a reduction potential of 80 terawatt hours in low ambition and 115 terawatt hours in high ambition. We did the same for the other sectors. Um, for electricity, we have, of course, slightly different measures. We also have a different categorization of the demand data. Um, here we looked at, for example, uh, smart meters, the feedback systems, um, energy audits for industry. And we came up with this potential. So starting from um, approximately 300 terawatt hours of reference initial energy demand, um, we, uh, we identified a reduction potential of 18 terawatt hours in low ambition and 60 terawatt hours in high ambition. So um, the heat sector would be the sector which has the highest initial uh, energy demand. So here we start at uh, approximately 800 terawatt hours. So we, we, we have a really higher starting point. And uh, we looked at several measures here differentiated in residential and commercial heat, uh, mostly hot water and space heating, but also process heat and really uh, high temperatures for uh, steel construction, et cetera. And here we discussed measures uh, such as lowering the average room temperature or decreasing living space per person. Um, and we estimated the potential of uh, approximately 124 terawatt hours uh, in high ambition. So I also understand that decreasing living space per person or lowering the average room temperature might be a quite debatable political instrument, but we will also catch up on this later in our discussion. Um, so this is the first part. Uh, we are determined the uh, potential for demand reductions in the three sectors. Uh, this is an overview now on uh, all the demand reductions that we uh, estimated. So here again, we have our reference demand. Uh, it's an annual energy demand. I forgot that earlier, I'm sorry. Um, of 1,450 terawatt hours. And we came to an overall demand reductions, uh, summing up for all the sectors, uh, summing up to uh, minus 9.4% in low ambition and minus 20% in high ambition. So this translates to approximately 300 terawatt hours of absolute demand reductions in our high ambition scenario. Um, the next step would be to use this um, potential that we identified um, and implement it into a least cost capacity expansion model for the whole energy system. So for this, we used a, a framework called, called Animod. Um, it's implemented in Julia and we used uh, only 100% renewable gener generation technologies for this um, for this model, it's a greenfield model, so we didn't assume any existing capacities. And we also modeled Germany as an island system. Both of these assumptions are also debatable, but we uh, wanted to focus really on the, um, on the effects that the demand reductions have and neglect things like imports or transition pathways. And our demand time series comes from the open entrance project. Um, so this is the energy system model, uh, an overview uh, of the technologies and carriers that we um, applied using the Animod framework. And um, here the, the colored squares, they represent energy carriers. So in our analysis, we have electricity, we have hydrogen, and we have synthetic gas. And the gray circles, um, they, um, 
represent technologies. So uh, we have some generation, some conversion uh, technologies, but also storage technologies. And the arrows indicate um, carrier generation or carrier conversion. Um, and since it's a quite comprehensive model, we limited uh, here the depiction to the objective function, which consists of different cost components. Um, we can also go into this into depth at another point, but there's also a full documentation of the whole framework uh, online, which you can find um, in the references. So um, this is, uh, well, not a first result, but um, uh, this is how uh, the energy system looked like when we modeled the reference case. Um, so our initial unchanged demand and um, in the right side of this, um, of this energy flow diagram, you can see the three sectors. So we have here the heat sector, here the mobility sector and the conventional electricity sector. Um, and here you can also see the, re the ratios of energy demand. And on the left side, you can see the generation technologies that supply this demand. And in the middle, you can see the, well, the um, way the energy is converted, stored and converted back to meet this demand. So, um, well, what, what we can see first of all is that uh, we have full wind and PV generation, which is partially directly used for the, uh, for the sectoral energy demand, but also um, either stored as electricity or um, converted to hydrogen, stored as hydrogen or directly used in the mobility sector as hydrogen. And we have small shares of methanation and the usage of synthetic gas for the heat sector. So second results or, uh, well, first results actually um, would be uh, the generation capacities and the storage capacities. So in this bar chart here on the left side, you can see the generation capacities um, that result uh, from our modeling process. On the right side, you can see the, um, the storage size uh, that, 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 that um, is required to meet this demand um, in a cost optimal way. So, as, 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 as you can see here, um, the, the coming from the reference case to low and high ambition significantly reduces the required PV capacity and also the um, required storage capacity um, for short-term batteries, but also for long-term gas storage. Five minutes, Elmar. Ah, okay. thank you. Five minutes, yes. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I think this will work out well. Uh, so, and here we also have our total system cost reduction. So in reference, we have 0%, of course, but low and high ambition reduce the total system costs with 11 and 25% respectively. And overall, we have in uh, high ambition, a generation capacity reduction of 30% and a storage capacity reduction of approximately 45%. Um, so this would be central results of our low and high ambition scenario. So to sum it up, we have reduction of generation capacity uh, requirements. We have reduction of storage um, capacity requirements, and we have uh, total system cost reductions that are based on the changed demand um, time series that we use as an input for the model based on the sufficiency measures. Um, so the next step or the final step of our analysis was doing a sensitivity analysis. So here we looked at the sectors individually and um, modeled the sectors individually without changing the other sectors. So um, we did that um, for all the three sectors and in the, um, in, in the left bar chart here, you can see the demand reductions, the relative demand reductions. So um, heat and mobility, they come up to approximately 8% and conventional electricity comes up to 4%. So what is interesting here or what is the key takeaway here is that, uh, for example, um, you have from heat and mobility 8% of demand reduction, but this leads to or translates to 27% uh, uh, storage capacity reductions for heat and 11% storage capacity reduction 
for uh, mobility, for example. So the effect of the um, demand reductions is amplified in the, on the supply side. And this is also reflected in the cost. So uh, for example, 8% of heat demand reduction results in approximately 12% of cost reduction. Um, so from that, we also calculated the, um, the well, something like the cost demand ratio. Um, and we, uh, we, we noticed that the, uh, the heat sector is the most cost efficient sector for sufficiency based demand reductions. Um, this works well. So uh, coming to the conclusion um, and summing up or looking back at our research question. So we wanted to look at the potential of sufficiency based demand reductions and the impacts on the supply side of a 100% renewable energy system in Germany. And our research um, provided hopefully some first insights for future research. So based on the literature that we reviewed, um, we identified political instruments and saw that there is certainly a potential for sufficiency-based demand reductions, and it can contribute to facilitate a 100% renewable supply side because it reduces the generation capacity and storage capacity requirements that are needed to meet the energy demand. Um, but we also see this as um, kind of uh, creating spaces of opportunity, because as I mentioned before, um, we, we understand that we didn't differentiate in between the measures that we identified uh, to reduce the energy demand. So some of them might be politically more feasible uh, than others, and some of them might also be problematic in terms of distributional effects uh, or other things. So um, we, we, we saw our, uh, our modeling approach as really uh, understanding the, the, the levers of behavioral change. So which sector and which instrument can or has the greatest impact on the supply side, but without really looking at the feasibility of uh, the measures. So this would also be, um, something for an outlook. So future and especially transdisciplinary research should um, understand and, and evaluate this, um, these policy instruments and uh, promote sufficiency in, 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 in policy. And also um, as like, uh, like a recommendation at least for, um, for policy. So we thought based on this that, um, well, first of all, energy system modeling should include um, sufficiency or changed human behavior in at least one scenario in each study, but also the political framework should at least be redesigned to facilitate sufficient behavior in order to increase the likelihood that humans actually consume energy in a responsible and sufficient way. So I think, um, I hope I'm quite good on the time or at least fair enough on the time. And thank you for your, um, uh, for your attention and in case there are any questions uh, i'm glad to answer them now or open okay. for thank you very much elmar we are uh, a little bit past the time but no, don't worry you have five minutes uh, to to make questions i think there is a a person that is uh, let me see bianca has a question she raised her hand you can take the the microphone and ask a yeah. question if you wish Hey, can you hear me? Trying to yes. put the camera on. Maybe nicer. <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you. It was really interesting. I'm Bianca Choi. I work in France at the French TSO. And we're actually having uh, we're actually working on our scenarios for 2050. And I'm coordinating the sufficiency scenario. So that was really interesting for me. Uh, thank you very much. And I had a question on how you quantified your sufficiency measures. Especially in the road uh, part, I noticed that um, I think you didn't you didn't consider like um, going from passenger road to to public transportation, for instance. Could you tell me why? And in general, um, did you try to take um, I don't know regional scale or things like that to to calibrate your um, mobility sufficiency measure? How, how did you do that? Could you detail a little more? That would be great. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um. I can also maybe again show the slide. Uh, 
so um are we talking about this um yes so um well first of all thanks for your feedback um and uh, my back question would be of if you're coming from this negawatt scenarios because we looked at them also um but to your question, so um, we didn't consider a model shift because we had our demand data in a way that you can see it here. So we had air, road, and rail uh, demand divided into passenger and freight transport. And um, I think model shift is quite an important um, assumption or measure to take, uh, especially in between individual transports and, for example, public transport. But um, it was too complicated for our analysis, to be honest. Because then we would have to, when we reduce the uh, passenger road transport, we would have this. Uh, we have to, would have to translate this to an increase in the um, rail passenger transport. Yes. And this was, at the moment at least, with the given resources, with our given resources, okay. it was slightly too much. But um, I think this might be something which which would be really interesting for the future, or also, um, I don't know, for all the three sectors not only for mobility but also for electricity and heat include maybe something like pre-models that more accurate accurately quantify the measures that we discussed and then use it as an import for the energy system model because so far this has been something like okay we identified sound numbers for, from literature but we didn't really go into detail i mean for mobility you can probably also model like model okay. choice using logarithmic yeah. functions or Thank you, Elmar. Uh, we are uh, we have a delay, but we have two two people who wants to ask. But uh, really, very uh, in a very short time, please, Jacqueline. You just can respond uh, briefly. I I would acknowledge you. Um, I am not sure if I missed this. Actually, in that case, uh, apologies. But I was wondering uh, in the mobility sector. Um, about electrification, which may also apply to other sectors, where you uh, might actually see an increase in electricity demand from electric vehicles. Um, if you were wondering about that or how you would include that as a kind of counteracting uh, effect, maybe. Um, definitely. So we did implicitly assume that because the demand um, that we used assumes already a fully electrified, uh, for example, passenger road transport and uh, the air transport is, for example, fully met by hydrogen. So this is implicitly included already. And this is based on another project that was done by different uh, people. It's called the Open Entrance Project. You can find it in the references, maybe. So they kind of did that for us. Um, so we didn't explicitly model it again. Thank you. The last Femi, uh, very quickly, please. Um, hi, thank you, Elma. Um, and I hope I didn't miss this in your presentation. Um, uh, you might have answered it as well in your reference to the open entrance project. But I was wondering if you uh, considered the hourly daily demand profiles um, and how that changed according to different ambitions of sufficiency. Um, and because in, in your conclusion, you mentioned how the changes in behavior according to uh, uh, sufficiency and, and other changes enabled that 100% renewable energy electricity system. And so I was wondering if uh, your, your project, your analysis considered that, and if so, what changes you observed um, that enabled this? Just to understand, for flying, for air transport, was that the question? No, no, for your demand on the whole, or uh, across the whole. Because, yes, we, how did uh, our hourly demand profiles change? Mm -hmm. Or did you model that? Did you consider that? or? in terms of impact on base load electricity requires supply requirements and, and whatnot. Okay, I think I get. So yes, we used um, hourly time series. This is um, for some sectors, it was better than for others. So for example, for the mobility sector, to be honest, our hourly demand time series, time series, time series sorry, is not really good. We're working on that because it just works in a way that we, defined several days and then scaled these days up and added them to a time series. But we have differences in hourly time, uh, in, in, in hourly uh, energy demand. Um, so our analysis hopefully covers the fluctuations 
from generation, of course, renewable generation, but also from demand. And we also assumed that for um, our reduction, so for example, when we reduce the, um, the, the mobility or the, the road passenger transport demand for commuting, we did that in certain hours where we looked at statistics. Okay, when do the people travel to work and when do the people travel back, most of them? And then we reduced the, um, the energy demand only in these hours. So um, I hope this answers the question, but we try to reflect the temporal, um, well, the temporal differences, but it has certainly room for improvement. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your clear presentation. Let's go to the next one. I give the floor to Aymantas, please. 20 minutes. Uh... Sure. Okay. So, uh, dear chairman, participants, uh, I'm Eamon Tasnanishkis, a junior research associate from the Ukrainian Energy Institute. And on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Arvidas Galinas and Egidius Norvisha, I will give you a presentation on increasing transport modeling detail in energy planning models, vehicle age distributions, car classes, and fuel blending. Now, just uh, let me define what I mean by uh, saying energy plan models, to be clear. Uh, I mean bottom-up models with linear or mixed integer programming, uh, optimization based on minimization of total discounted costs. So there are numerous of such energy plan models. Probably some of you are familiar with time, either times, Balmorel, Osmosis. But in this case, we use message uh, modeling software uh, to, to develop uh, this approach. Now, just before I continue, I'd uh, like to make an acknowledgement that this work was conducted within the DECAR project, which is funded by Research Council on, uh, of Lithuania. The ideas of this project is uh, to develop a methodology for a uh, multi-sectoral approach in uh, deep decarbonization of the economy. So what I'm presenting to you today is just a small part of the transport sector modeling, uh, but I, I believe it is important one. And another short acknowledgement that this is, this is also part of my PhD thesis integrated assessment of least cost decarbonization pathways of transport and energy sectors. So now you might have a question, okay, why to model transport sector in energy planning model, which is not the, uh, the purpose is not uh, for the transport modeling, but explicitly for uh, power and heat sectors. Well, first, let me just say that uh, transport sector is one of the most greenhouse gas emitting sector, and actually it is the highest emitting sector in the US and second in EU. And various countries have very ambitious targets to uh, decrease the emissions in the transport sector. In the case of the EU, it is to reduce emissions by 90% to 2050. And the most viable options, uh, the carbon-free options for the transport are either uh, electric vehicles, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles, or uh, the use of biofuels. Now, if we are to assume uh, that in the future we're to expect the rapid electric vehicle fleet expansion, we need to take into account that this will definitely affect the overall electricity demand and not just the demand as the amount of electricity needed annually, but it will affect the hourly uh, shape of the demand curve. So this is very important. Now, uh, another very important thing and the argument why these two sectors should be uh, modeled jointly because the effectiveness of transport sector decarbonization really depends on the electricity generation mix. If uh, let's say we have a case where all electricity is produced by a coal power plants, in such case, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles might be even more uh, environmentally friendly. Now, another uh, thing is that uh, it is possible to utilize the moments when electric vehicles uh, uh, are charging to at least partially balance the rival generation from renewable energy sources. And the similar thing can be done uh, for hydrogen production using electrolysis process. Now, uh, what approaches are already applied for transport modeling in energy planning model? Uh, the approaches use 
uh, typically in the literature you find something like this. Uh, well, on the vertical lines, uh, you can see energy carriers, commodities or energy forms, so which term are you familiar more? And uh, in these boxes are technologies or processes. So the idea is that the, this technology, let's say diesel car uses some type of uh, fuel, in this case diesel, to produce uh, travel. Uh, this travel typically is differentiated by the travel mode. So we have one specified for personal cars, then for buses, trucks, trains, and etc. Now, what is uh, what are the pros of this approach? It, well, it is re uh, relatively easy to create such models, not that difficult to incorporate into the power sector model, uh, easy to calibrate using the statistical data. It does not require that much of the data, and it's comparatively lightweight. However, it has some cons. First of all, the technological changes affect uh, not just uh, the uh, a capacity addition. Well, it, uh, it, okay, maybe this example will be more clear. Let's say in the model, I specify that uh, in each year, diesel cars get more and more uh, fuel efficient. Uh, if I specify this, this affects not only uh, the efficiency of new diesel cars, but this affects also the efficiency of diesel cars already in the stock. So this is somewhat problematic. Uh, another thing that typically uh, by modeling in this way, we get somewhat unrealistic fuel shifts. They tend to be uh, too rapid. Therefore, modelers usually rely on uh, penetration rates or uh, some type of constraints. And the last con would be that this allows no model shift. As a solution, uh, there was an interesting paper by Hani Daly where she proposed uh, to differentiate uh, demands not between different modes, but in short and long distance travel modes. Uh, and the most revolutionary idea that she, she proposed was to use the fixed travel time budget. So vehicles consume not only fuel, but also time from this time budget. This time budget was based on the paper by Andrea Schoffer and his statement that on average, people spend 1.1 hour for traveling regardless of the travel mode. Uh, this includes even walkings. But with the equations you see on the right, this can, you can estimate the travel time budget for the motorized travel, which then this budget can be used uh, within the model. So how this looks in the energy plan model. Uh, okay, as I mentioned, it is a good idea to differentiate uh, demand by short and long distance travel, and then some uh, modes can uh, supply this travel either for uh, short or long distance travel. So city buses, trolley buses, metros, let's say, can be used uh, explicitly for short distance travel, while trains, planes, or uh, can be explicitly for uh, long distance travel, while Personal cars can be used for the both. Now, uh, uh, this technology, okay, uh, as is an example for uh, personal car. It, uh, let's take a look at the petrol car. It consumes fuel and produces travel. So, how much it produces travel is not that difficult to calculate once you know the fuel efficiency and uh, occupant rate of the vehicle. But the question is, OK, now how to determine uh, time consumption rate? And in message, it is expressed in relation to the main input, which is uh, fuel. So time consumption rate can be calculated by dividing fuel efficiency, uh, which is in person kilometers per kilogram of fuel. And uh, this uh, fuel efficiency is divided by the average speed in a corresponding travel mode. So we get uh, in the units of person hours per kilogram of fuel. Now, just by uh, from my personal experience, I have several maybe suggestions what is uh, better, better to do. Uh, still, uh, in my opinion, it is better to have a separate demands for airborne and naval transport as uh, they're not direct substitutes for uh, the personal tra travel or per per travel with, with personal cars. So it is better to have uh, as a different demand. It gives somewhat better results. 
And uh, another based on personal experience, it is a good idea to split uh, travel time budget uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, this results in a better representation of public transport. Now, okay, you might uh, have a question. Okay, why is it necessary to model this travel time budget for the modal shift? You see, uh, since the model works in the uh, discounted cost minimization way, uh, it will always try to satisfy the uh, demand in the cheapest of, with the cheapest option. If we have no constraints, uh, since uh, public transport is significantly the cheapest option, it will satisfy the demand solely with the public transport, as you see on the chart on the left. However, if we implement this travel time fixed travel time budget, it limits how much uh, the public transport can be utilized and you get somewhat uh, more reasonable results. Now, moving to the main part of my presentation. Okay, how to uh, add detail e uh, even further? What are the next steps? So the first thing I want to propose is uh, modeling vehicle age distributions. Okay, why this is important? Let's take uh, uh, two different cases we were from completely two different countries. So the US, a major country, uh, has a declining uh, vehicle age distribution curve. While Lithuania is a relatively small country, which has an access to a, a huge mar market of pre-used vehicles, has a more like a bell-shaped curve. So if we are to assume, okay, starting from now, uh, it, it's banned to sell new uh, internal combustion cars. And from now on, all new vehicles are electric vehicles. In this case, after 10 years, it will amount to 56% of uh, total fleet in the US and only 16% in Lithuania. So as you see, uh, the vehicle age distribution might affect significantly the fuel change in the transport. So how to implement this in the model? Uh, first, you need to differentiate vehicles, not just by fuel and the mode. You need to differentiate vehicles also by the build year. Personally, I prefer uh, to differentiate up to 12 to 20 by Euro standards. Uh, it is better, but, but easier to uh, estimate and evaluate what uh, fuel consumption rate should be. But after 2020, uh, by, I just use five-year intervals. And this allows uh, to better represent fuel shift, fuel consumption, and VN emissions, uh, because we can specify more precisely the vehicle purchase price as it, uh, how it changes with each generation of vehicles. Then we can specify how maintenance cost changes of the vehicle with its age. So in, as vehicle ages due to more wear and tear, uh, you, typically the maintenance cost increases. Also, uh, fuel consumption rate changes with uh, each generation of vehicles. And in case for like Lithuania, where uh, on average people, uh, when they're acquiring a new car, it's, it's already a pre-used car from the foreign market. So then it is very important to evaluate for the vehicle depreciation. So, okay, uh, let's say we differentiate vehicles uh, by year, but how to uh, model this vehicle age distribution? Well, this is basically uh, based on the series of uh, equations, uh, well, constraints on the model, where we basically say that, okay, in the year 2020, uh, personal cars made between 2015 and 2020 must uh, comprise, uh, let's say 11% of uh, total travel by personal cars uh, in this year. And the, the, this equation has been, uh, been has to be repeated for all age groups, of course, using uh, the five, different- Five minutes, okay. Okay, so I'll try to rush it somewhat. Okay, so- uh, we try to compare uh, the results using the traditional approach and uh, our proposed approach using this vehicle age distribution. 
And what we found that uh, traditional approach uh, tends to uh, have uh, the higher penetration of uh, electric vehicles and uh, a, a rapid fuel shift. And it might be the case, what I said, that uh, without more detailed uh, modeling of transport, the fuel shift might be uh, somewhat too rapid. Now, the next step would be car classes. So uh, it is possible to differentiate and give more detail to the model by differentiating not only by uh, uh, age groups and the modes of travel, but also uh, by the class, in this case would be uh, mini and small cars, medium and large, executive and luxury, uh, SUVs and MPVs. This allows uh, to increase the efficiency, uh, well, to model the, uh, how efficiency depends uh, on the car class and also uh, how uh, vehicle prices depend. And the last thing I wanted to present to you is fuel blending. The idea is that, okay, the third option that I mentioned for the decarbonizing of transport sector is the use of biofuels. And uh, it is most likely that biofuels will be blended uh, uh, incrementally with, with, the, with the years. So uh, for diesel cars, as, as they, are, they have a more forgiving engines, uh, it is more easier to in increase uh, the content of biodiesel. Uh, basically, uh, the, the main thing that prevents is the, the uh, gelling effect uh, during the colder months. And, but for petrol cars, uh, it is a bit different situation as older cars uh, generally cannot run on the higher content of uh, bioethanol. So for this reason, uh, we have to separate blends uh, that can uh, be used by different uh, age groups. And for, for this, idea uh, we have to have te technologies which produce uh, different blends that can be used for different age groups. Now, the last important thing uh, with the fuel blends is that uh, still you need to take into consideration the loss of efficiency due to decrease the calorific value as you increase uh, the biofuel content. This can be done either way, yeah, either for directly uh, by adjusting efficiency for vehicle technologies or by decreasing the output of the blend, uh, because usually it is expressed in, in the units of energy. So uh, these are the results taken into uh, taking, uh, adding all of these improvements mentioned before. And uh, as you see, the results are much more gradual uh, co compared to, to what uh, I showed you previously. And maybe it's because of the increased uh, detail and uh, furthermore uh, it is also uh, affects the gradual not only just the fuel shift but also the CO2 uh, emissions which I believe are uh, somewhat more correct due to the more detailed data. So that's what I wanted to present you today. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Imantas. I can see that it's a very hard work, difficult to resume in uh, 20 minutes. Does anybody has a question, please? Well, anybody wants to ask? Okay, Imantas, uh, if you could uh, say the, the, the main uh, conclusion, the main uh, energy policy remarks from this uh, work, uh, could you resume what is the, 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 the most important message that you can uh, say as uh, derived from this uh, work in your country? Okay, so based on my country, uh... What I can see that uh, just by looking at, uh, okay, the results I want to say were not constrained in any way that by certain year, we should reach certain share of electric vehicles. This is solely based on the economics. And uh, is it worth for uh, the people to switch? And actually for electric vehicles, I even 
uh, applied what's called inconvenience cost, as it has some premium uh, to owning electric vehicles, since uh, there's always a risk that you won't have enough charge to reach your destination. So just by looking at this, uh, I can say that it is likely that Lithuania would manage to reach their national targets. And actually, I was really surprised that when I looked at the NSCP targets uh, by country that my modeling results relatively, well, it matches relatively nicely to the targets, even though, uh, even though the model was not really constrained to reach those. So my main conclusion uh, regarding the policy scenarios would be that uh, it is likely that uh, the policy targets might be achieved just uh, by the technological improvements in electric vehicle technologies. And another conclusion is that uh, it is unlikely that we'll see a significant change to the fuel cell electric vehicles based on the assumptions, uh, cost assumptions we use. Okay, the main, uh, the main conclusion is that uh, the electrification of the economy through electric vehicles maybe is the most important uh, target, the most important measure that your, your country is considering. It is, um, uh, maybe I'll sum up like this, the electric vehicles are the most likely option to decarbonize uh, the transport sector. Okay. Thank you very much, the Imanta, for your clear presentation. And we are, uh, I will give the floor to Jacqueline that is going to speak at us about the technology, endogenous technology change. Yes, thank you. Um, let me try and share my screen. I hope you are able. You are able to see it now. Um, sorry, okay, I see nodding, perfect. Uh, yes, so um, I'm Jacqueline Mandinovo. I am um, at the IFO Institute, a PhD student at the University of Munich. And um, I will be talking about endogenizing technological change today in power market models. And um, this is joint work with two colleagues from my department at IFO Institute, Valeria Azarova and Matthias Mia. Um, just to give you maybe a sneak peek um, about what we're doing, uh, we extend an existing numerical model of the European electricity market by learning by doing for renewables. And we um, then in a second step, develop a new framework extension to also account for exp experience depreciation in learning by doing, which is kind of a more sophisticated uh, feature. And in the end, we will look at some uh, qualitative model behavior and uh, endogenous learning. Um, however, it will be qualitative um, because we are currently still using a provisional um, calibration for learning. Uh, some background maybe about power market models. We've um, heard some um, information already. Um, usually they are really useful tool for policymakers to evaluate um, climate and energy policies like the Paris Agreement or the European Green Deal and to uh, look at what impacts they have on the electricity system. And what those um, models typically do is that they evaluate different scenarios and then calculate um, system outcomes, for example, in terms of system costs or um, installed capacities. And what we see is that um, in a really important driver of those system outcomes are the cost developments of generation technologies. And in the past, um, often um, exogenous, cost assumptions were used that are uh, where unit costs for um, new capacity just get cheaper over time automatically. And um, that can produce really unrealistic regional bang bang solutions, meaning that you have this waiting incentive in perfect foresight models where a region can just wait for the technology to get cheap enough and then build a lot of capacity, even though it actually doesn't have any um, or not a lot of prior experience, which is um, yeah, an unwanted and unrealistic behavior. What can we do about it? Um, looking at the literature, I just put the um, main papers here. So this is definitely not an exhaustive uh, list that we use. 
but uh, we mainly draw on two um, different fields of literature. The first one is about learning concepts, learning curves in general, learning mechanisms, where we go back to the concept of learning curves from right in 1936, but also um, econometric um, estimations of um, learning rates for renewable technologies. And um, for example, we have also some work by Argent and Apple and Bankart on organizational forgetting. And uh, for example, also on spillovers in the Nemeth 2012 paper. The second field of literature is um, more specifically about how you can implement endogenous technological change in numerical models. Um, and there was some great work done by Zelina in 1997, which was then um, further developed um, in the Cupress et al. paper, which we will be mainly using as implementation strategy. Um, and we also have some further extensions of that, also towards um, nonlinear uh, models and um, some recent applications also, for example, in the Heuberger et al. paper, um, where they um, applied um, basically this strategy from Cuprios to the UK power market. Oops, that was not correct. I have to go back to the presentation. Um, so what we are doing now is um, that we implement endogenous technological change in the EU region power market model um, by implementing regional learning by doing for three technologies. Um, that's solar, wind onshore, and wind offshore. And we basically implement two different uh, specifications. The first one is um, perfect recall, which we also frame as our base case, uh, which is an application of existing learning by doing frameworks from literature. And the second specification um, we frame as forgetting, where we implement our framework extension uh, with experience depreciation. We also explore um, spillover effects and different learning and numerical specifications, but that would be a little too much to cover for today. Mm, about, the, about our case study, the EU region um, power market model mm, is a partial equilibrium model with a resolution of up to 28 European countries. It has a set of generation technologies, fossil and renewable, uh, storage and transmission. It also has emiss emissions and a carbon price, and it then mimics an hourly market clearing, basically. And a, it's an intertemporal um, optimization model, so it minimizes system costs over the modeling horizon until 2050 uh, in five year investment periods. Uh, some work about the model itself, the development of the model can be taken from Blanford and Weisbad and Weisbad, uh, but there are also um, further applications of the model from um, colleagues in my department. If you're interested in that, you can also get back to me about that. Let's take a look at our numerical strategy. Uh, we start off with um, a unit cost learning curve where we have a a certain initial unit cost for a technology I in a region R, and we have an experience stock QS. Uh, and in the experiment, we see B, the negative learning elasticity, meaning that the cost at which we are able to build um, one unit of new capacity is always dependent on the size of our experience stock that we have at that point in time. And the experience stock is just the cumulative um, capacity that has ever been built for that technology. And we can see that this equation is highly nonlinear, and the challenge is to linearize this into a mixed integer um, program in order to get the capacity expansion IX uh, per period and the associated capital expenditure CapEx um, at which we can build this uh, capacity. We follow a two-step linearization procedure, um, as I said, um, uh, the one from Cupress et al, uh, where we first integrate the unit cost curve over the experience stock um, to arrive at the cumulative cost curve, which we can see down here. And then we kind of slice um, the curve into um, piecewise linear segments. And as you can see, the parts um, or the segments in the steeper parts of the curve are shorter, that is to represent those um, parts of the curve more accurately. 
And then what the model um, basically does is that it places itself on the curve in each period um, where we have an associated um, size of the um, experience stock and a certain level of cumulative cost. And then um, we would, for example, jump to this point in the next period and then we can simply derive the capacity expansion in that period as the difference in the size of the experience stock from one period to the, to the other. And um, same goes for the capex on the vertical axis. We now um, move to our framework extension where we introduce a depreciation factor delta, uh, which uh, basically um, simply um, depreciates our experience stock that we inherit from previous periods. And we arrive at our current um, experience stock by this depreciated inherited experience plus the capacity expansion that we have in our current period. So if we're looking at the graph, we can see that this term here basically um, lets us slide back on the line segment as compared to the version we don't have forgetting. And if we look at what happens if you want to derive the, um, the capacity expansion at the mere difference in experience stocks from one period to the other, we see that we have this negative bias in capacity expansion. And this then also translates to the capex. And that's something that we don't want. Um, and as a solution, we need to calculate what our experience stock that we inherit from previous periods is worth in the next. Uh, in the next period. And um, that's a uh, quantity we call a legacy experience. And um, looking at the graph, what we do by introducing this legacy experience is that we basically mimic the, mimic the sliding back or simulate the sliding back also for our inherited uh, experience, which has this additional depreciation step. And once we do that, we can again derive the capacity expansion as a difference in the size of the experience stock from our current period and the depreciated legacy experience that we inherit. And then same goes for the capex, which we can now calculate in an unbiased way and add it to the objective function of the model. In our default implementation, we um, use a um, model specification where we have five line segments. You can play around with that number. There's um, also um, literature out there and five is just in, in, a, in a range that is um, often used. And we have uh, regional learning of 12 European regions. So we group some countries together um, and each region learns separately and independently of the other regions. And as I said in the beginning, we are currently still using a provisional calibration at this point in time, because there's a huge variation in um, the learning elasticities um, out there. And um, we kind of use something that's uh, in line with literature, but as I said, well, there's still um, some, uh, some fine tuning to do. We currently use 9% for solar wind onshore and wind offshore. And for the forgetting, we apply a 3% annual depreciation rate. Looking at um, the results, um, I know that this graph is kind of small. I will do my best to um, guide you through it. Um, so what we do here is we compare our old exogenous uh, version of the model with our base case learning version. And in the graph, you can see the install capacities um, from 2015 until 2050 in Germany. And um, this is a side-by-side -side comparison of the exogenous model, which is always the left bar, and the endogenous learning uh, base case model on the right-hand side. And um, what we can see uh, is that in the end, we arrive at less um, renewable expansion, um, striking is here the um, light blue wind offshore, uh, sorry, wind onshore um, capacity, which is um, less than we had in the exogenous model. And um, that is due to our calibration also, because um, apparently it is cheaper in the exogenous cost assumptions for the model to expand, to, to expand capacity, which is why it expands more. And um, we can see that this is kind of compensated by building more gas CCS um, just in order to 
still achieve a certain level of emission um, CO2 reduction. Mm, what we can also see is that the timing of investments is slightly shifted. We can see that in the exogenous um, version of the model, if we're looking at wind capacity again, for example, we don't have much going on until 2030, um, still not until 35, and then we have a um, significant uh, capacity expansion wave or peak in 2040 going on. Um, if we look at the right-hand side bars for the endogenous learning, we can see that there's already um, a strong increase in expansion in 2030, um, which is then even uh, increased in 35. So we have this um, pull, pulling forward of um, expansion and this weighting incentive um, that we have in exogenous cost assumptions disappears. And um, from this, you can also see that those regional bang bangs are partially reduced. However, that's not valid for all regions um, because they're just um, heterogeneous and sometimes also interdependent um, of each other. Looking at our second um, um, endogenous technological change specification where we uh, include forgetting, um, we have the same graphs here. Again, 2015 until the 2050 period, um, we have this side-by-side -side comparison again, where on the left-hand side, we have our base case with perfect recall. And on the right-hand side, we have our model that has forgetting. And um, maybe intuitively, you would think that with depreciation of experience, um, expanding capacity would get more expensive and the model will build less capacity less new capacity, but that's actually not what we see. Instead, we even see um, slightly higher capacity expansion of wind, for example, in the forgetting version of the model, which is um, a so-called offsetting effect. Um, it had, has already been described for learning by searching. Um, we can now see it uh, for learning by doing as well, which is basically just a model behavior where um, the model tries to offset or outpace the experience losses from forgetting by building even more capacity. Uh, if we look at the um, region level now, now, because this was the aggregate EU um, in full capacity, we now move to um, the um, regional perspective for Britain, for example, um, where we can see some condensed or smooth uh, expansion behavior when, once we include forgetting. Uh, this graph now shows the added capacities per period, so not the cumulative um, capacity anymore. And again, we have on the left side perfect recall, on the right hand side forgetting. And what we can see if we look at our base case with perfect recall, we have this huge increase um, or an expansion peak really in 2035. Then it, it kind of declines again to 2040 and then the second peak in 2045. Um, well, once we include forgetting, this kind of changes um, to a more smooth wave where we have already increased expansion in 2030, even more or even more expansion in 35. We reach the peak in 2040 and then it slowly declines again. So we have a more, really a more realistic um, behavior that we can also see in, um, in the real world. Some general insights, uh, if I still have the time. Um, Jacqueline, the... five minutes, please. Perfect. Um, some general um, insights are that um, we see that the model is very sensitive to the learning parameters and that it also reacts to um, changes in the way that we do this line segmentation of the cumulative cost curve. Um, and we also see that computational feasibility is really um, strongly increased once we endogenize technological change. As uh, next steps, um, we are currently working on fine tuning the calibration and also um, on adding some sensitivity checks. And um, we're also playing around with the number of line segments um, to choose an optimal number and maybe to extend the number of um, learning technologies um, that we use. Um, and also, of course, um, you can extend the learning channels, for example, to include learning by searching and spillovers. Um, however, there you can run into um, additional challenges, like, for example, if you include learning by searching and then have a two-factor learning um, setting, 
you will have to change this to a nonlinear implementation. And there you have new um, challenges with feasibility um, and computational issues, basically. Um, we also, we're also seeing um, as a challenge to choose the adequate learning specifications. So which technologies do we actually include? What are the right learning mechanisms that we should choose? And um, for all of that, always the data availability is really uh, crucial to um, have a proper calibration. And that is definitely a challenge um, for newer technologies. To conclude, um, we see that we are in this constant trade off of uh, representing complex uh, learning processes and complex um, representation of endogenous learning um, versus feasibility of the model still being able to solve it computationally. Mm, but we also see that it is worth an effort to um, endogenize learning because it, reads, it leads to really more realistic expansion behavior and therefore um, provides a better basis for policy design and policy evaluation. And um, we also uh, can see from looking into the, into the regional perspectives that it's really important to look what's happening behind aggregate values to really dig into um, the different dynamics that learning has. And as I also said, um, calibration is crucial to really carefully do that. Um, and we also see potential for even more sophisticated learning features. However, um, there, that's really dependent on the data availability if you're able to include and also calibrate those more sophisticated features. Yes, thank you, that's, uh, that was it. And I'm um, really interested in maybe comments and questions also on the computational challenges, maybe if anyone has some remarks on that, that's highly welcome. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Uh, it's a very clear presentation, very interesting. Uh, a little bit uh, complicated for people that uh, don't know this issue. It's no expert in this issue, but it's very interesting. Does anybody wants to ask to make there question, a please? Question from uh, Femi. You can take the. Thanks, Jacqueline, for an interesting presentation. Um, uh, my question is a, is a hopeful one, really. So I know you mentioned in your next steps that you plan to perform some sensitivities around the, around the learning rates, um, given the var variation in the literature. I was wondering if you had, had started work on that already and what perhaps you're seeing in terms of the impacts on your results. Mm, yes, so um, we have started uh, playing around with that. Um, I. I think I have a graph somewhere here. Let me see. Um, it's Wednesday ones. Um, so um, this um, is a side by side comparison for learning elasticity of six percent and twelve percent. So um, to the like a smaller and a higher learning elasticity, and um, as you can see, it really influences results. However, that is also um, really important on when you actually assume like the, the start of this learning process, because our model horizon starts in 2015. Um, so it, changing the learning elasticity already influences um, the size of the experience of in 2015, because um, those, te those technologies, they go back to the 80s, 90s, where already first capacities have been built. So there's also, it's a, it's a matter of when do you actually assume um, the start of the learning uh, process, um, and it really influences the, um, the, the cost that um, the, the model pays already in, um, in, the, in the different periods. So it has a huge impact. And um, I can say that um, this is also a joint project with the Technical University of Munich, who are currently working on um, econometrically estimating learning elasticities. So um, we're working jointly um, with them to um, have a careful calibration here because we see that it's really important. Thank you. Any more questions? Mm, there's Elmar who raised his hand. He can ask the question directly. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, also from my side for this presentation. Just um, a question for understanding. Um, did you assume uh, learning curves or endogenous technology, technological change for all technologies? 
And my question is most related to, I think, the first capacity expansion uh, bar chart that you showed, where um, in, in, well, introducing this ETC leads to a reduction of renewable uh, to generation capacity, but to an increase of gas, gas CCS, yes. Um, so this would be a surprising result for me to say that, okay, if you have this endogenous learning, it ends up being less renewable capacity. So my question would be, is there also endogenous learning for gas, carbon capture and storage? Yes, or how to, uh, yes. Yeah, I think a really um, good point there. Um, so uh, for the first question, currently we are only um, we only assume endogenous learning for solar, wind on trend, wind offshore. So um, no learning for the fossil um, technologies because there's not, not much cost, redu cost reduction going on anyways. But exactly from this from your second um, question, um, that that is something that we noticed too that we have this. Um, Kind of inter interaction with um, gas CCS, where we currently don't assume endogenous learning because there's also very little um, very little data about that out there currently. So um, we are thinking about extending um, the endogenous learning also for gas CCS because we see that we have this um, this interaction between the technologies there. Definitely good point. Yes. Thank you. Well, Mike. Thank you. Jacqueline, this is a very sophisticated model that you can uh, hark uh, in the future. But uh, my question is how to translate uh, these results to an effective energy policy uh, to, to, to des design uh, devices or the, in, in order to reach one target that a, a political target in, in the in the main in the energy policy field. Um, yes, so um, good question also because um, that is something that we are we are um, um, also worrying about. Seeing that um, the timing and the extent of investments of optimal investments into renewable technologies changes once you really try to to mimic learning processes that are actually going on you uh, might you might adapt the, the the design of policies in a way of when they kick in um, of what te technologies to support we also see that um, um, enhancing spillovers um, between different regions is really a great lever to um, to achieve um, fast penetration of renewables um, at almost no change of uh, system costs. So that is something that's also really interesting that um, the, the, the mere exchange between regions and learning and enhancing those spillovers is really helpful. Um, so that's definitely something that I um, um, that, that we see. And um, maybe if I, if I may come back to um, what Emma um, also asked about um, the, uh, decreased expansion in renewables once we account for learning compared to more capacity expansion with exogenous learning, because I, I realized I did not um, answer that. This is mainly due to the calibration that we currently have. So once you change the learning elasticities here, this might, this might really increase. Um, that's just something that uh, where we currently don't have um, the final calibration yet. Yes, thank you very much. I I always worry about that. The how to to do for the theoretical implications uh, could be translate into uh, very effective political devices. No, thank you very much. Very interesting. Okay, uh, we go. We move to the left to the last one that is uh, from Femi, and uh, is what is uh, speaking about Ethiopia. And um, I give you the floor. Thank you, pa pa Paco. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Femi Eludain um, of the, from UCL, University College London, uh, specifically the UC UCL Energy Institute. Um, presenting today, as Paco mentioned, uh, an approach we, we used uh, to, to model household electricity demand pathways in Ethiopia. Um, at the bottom there are the auth co-authors on this work. Yeah. 
Um, I'll speak today just about give a little bit of background to the pro to the to the work and the, the larger project that it was involved in, specifically around Ethiopia, the methodology used, uh, some results, and then I'll talk a little bit on future research. Um, so the pathways project was really about uh, the uh, modeling pathways for energy electricity system expansion planning for Ethiopia, um, UCL, uh, KTH uh, in Sweden, and two local uh, institutions, uh, pro project partners on this, on this project. It was funded by uh, the UK government in their energy and economic growth applied research program managed by Oxford Policy Management. Um, and the project is, this work is embedded in a larger project um, that uh, made use of uh, least cost uh, electricity system modeling, as well as uh, um, cost, optimal, cost, cost optimization for electricity access planning in a with a geospatial model. And so this work um, was, was to provide uh, demand overall, cross, demand across a range of sectors um, for those models, those electricity expansion models to electricity system expansion models to, to, to use. This was an in, integrated in that way. And then we decided to do further analysis uh, for the residential sector of Ethiopia, uh, looking uh, with a bottom up demand model uh, that modeled with LEAP, which is the, uh, the low emissions analysis platform, formerly the long range energy alternatives. Um, the planning system, uh, they, they've, they've updated, uh, I guess, their, their approach more recently. And so we, we expanded this, um, this part of the work to model pathways for Ethiopia's residential electricity demand um, by, by considering a bottom-up demand model that would look into the different service demands um, across urban and rural uh, segments of Ethiopia. Um, and this model tree structure that I'm showing here has a further level below. So we, it also, which I've not indicated here, it also shows uh, the different levels of efficiency for the different appliances uh, that serve the services. So for example, um, under refrigeration, you would have either a, a, a base case refrigerator and an improved efficient refrigerator for lighting. It would have CFLs, incandescent lighting, LEDs, um, for televisions, it would have the, the cathode ray tube as well as uh, LCD and LED TVs, for example, and, and so on. Um, we modeled it over a modeling horizon of 2017 to 2065, um, which is what the, the other models were working with as well. Um, so just a little bit on the, more on the method that was used. So this method was adapted from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories uh, Buenas uh, model that they developed. So in, in, in their version, they, they, their framework covers segments two, two, three, and four here. But in, in ours, we added this expert elicitation section in the beginning um, in the mixed method approach that we, were, that we were using. And we also, they usually cover um, national demand, but we broke our structure up into urban and, and rural. Um, and so in this first section, we interviewed local experts uh, to try and elicit their insights or rather their judgments on where certain um, model drivers, so e.g. Uh, GDP, uh, population, urbanization, where they feel they might be in the future. So rather than sort of using that, uh, or rather letting our uh, model inputs um, and assumptions be based simply on a single researcher or single modeler or modeling team's insights, we decided to elicit insights from 16 local uh, experts. Um, uh, those insights then impact so in, in, in the section in the second section we model um the diffusion of of, of these services so the services I, I mentioned before cooking television lighting we model their diffusion uh based using the s curve diffusion model uh and then we so re rearranged for linear regression using historical uh cross sec um, cross-sectional panel data for various countries to, to identify how 
changes or developments in the drivers, specifically GDP and other income variables, how change increases in, in, in that driver will increase the uh, diffusion of different services in, across uh, the urban and rural areas of, of Ethiopia. Um, and then within LEAP, so in, within LEAP, this, this framework adopts a, a stock, stock modeling, stock accounting uh, segments where each, each technology has uh, its, its, its um, how should I say, its vintage stock in the base year of the model. So it, in, in, it indicates uh, for how many, how many, the proportion of technologies in the stock um, that are how, however many years old. And then each technology also has its um, lifetime, lifetime, uh, uh, its, its lifetime uh, in years specified. And uh, the model, we then, uh, we then assume certain um, uh, percentage, um, percentage redundancy for each technology in the model, for each appliance in the model. Um, and also specify um, this is uh, exogenously uh, the, the level the number of the number of technologies the number of appliances sold for under each service um, the proportion that is sold in the market so for example in the base year for lighting uh, CFLs would would have a lower proportion of of um, would have a lower proportion in the market stock. Um, or that can be sold in any given year in the base year uh, compared to incandescent applying inc incandescent lighting technologies, for example. And then over time, this changes where um, with changes in the efficiency requirements that the government might institute, there are more CFLs and LED lighting technologies in the in the stock available to be sold as compared to incandescent technologies. And so all these things are con uh, fed into the model and the model as it as it runs to meet the the um, requirements of increasing diffusion of services across the different households in the urban and rural areas of of, of Ethiopia uh, it then it then does this uh, stock um, modeling of the appliance the exact appliance in each year of the model that is meeting this demand and so and then it does a and so and each or rather and also i thought to say in part four here each appliance has a unit energy consumption that is fixed um, in the model and the, the the sum of which therefore aggregates accounting of all those activity and the unit energy consumption to produce the final energy demand in each year over the model horizon um, so out of the section one there, we use the shelf elicitation protocol, which is uh, an expert elicitation protocol developed by uh, uh, some researchers originally from the University of Sheffield, Tony O'Hagan and uh, Jeremy Oakley, uh, where we uh, elicit um, the judgments. So, so we elicit the judgments of, of an uncertain variable uh, from an expert by a process that um, Presents them in the over in a probability distribution function. So they essentially tell us what their um, their probability limits are, what their median value is, and and using the, and also with quartiles. And so we can see, for example, then uh, what annual average annual growth in GDP might be. We have various. So th this is the median value. Experts also. In, um, gave us their quartile ranges and their limits, which would then, we then um, would estimate using the, 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 the program, the, the protocol, which was developed in R, we would fit their elicited values to a, a probability distribution that gives us a, the best fit with, so that's with a, with a normal distribution or a beta distribution with specific uh, scale um, and location parameters. And so we did this for each of the on. So these are the drivers that we selected to use in the model as drivers of diffusion, um, specifically GDP, but then also households and population 
um, would also determine um, final LNG demand in every in every year, and those change over time as well. Um, from these, you, there are there are so sometimes the expert elicitation is undertaken in groups uh, where you then do a behavior, uh, you then use sort of like a behavioral aggregation technique of all you get the experts to agree. But we did this; it was more. Um, useful for us and more practical for us to elicit uh, values from from experts individually and so we did 16 experts and we we we, we did them in individually and these are the distributions we can and so the experts were encouraged to give us their reasons for example for their judgments um uh, and we can see relatively similar uh, uh judgments for on the whole for example in urban population in 2060 um, but then quite a bit of variation in, in average annual growth in GDP. Um, what we decided was not to use a mathematical aggregation technique where you could essentially pool all the judgments that the, and combine all the judgments that the experts made into one distribution and sort of use that as our, uh, as our inputs to the model. But because we were running scenarios which were part of a larger project, uh, scenario narratives had been developed under another part of the project uh, where we consider, so if I go up to where we consider a uh, business as usual scenario, an ambition scenario, and a slowdown scenario. Um, and so what we did was to uh, intuitively look through the different uh, judgments that we obtained from the experts alongside and sort of integrate them with the narrative with the narratives that were developed under a workshop again with other local experts um, to uh, also considering um, as well how some of the the experiences of other countries perhaps with a similar starting position from a similar similar starting position that Ethiopia was in in 2017 as well as those other forecasts secondary forecasts that exist for these vari these variables for Ethiopia. And we obtained under those three different pathways, be it business as usual, the ambition and the slowdown scenario, um, pathways for each of those drivers. And, and we also then try to also consider uh, the co-evolution of drivers. So for example, um, based on economic theory or considering economic theory in, in that uh, where there is, there is slower growth in GDP as in the slowdown scenario, uh, perhaps we would find that's where population was obtained the largest growth. But each of the but each of the limits that were used, not just in terms of the average over the model horizon, but for each year, we considered everything that the local experts gave us in terms of their median values, uh, some of the limits that they gave us, and the reasons behind them. And so these are the scenario drivers for each scenario that was modeled. Um, and so just some results. Uh, in Ethiopia, injury baking is quite an energy intensive uh, activity and it dominates uh, household electricity cons consumption quite a bit, um, specific to them to make their, their injera, that is a local staple. And so that's, that dominates electricity consumption quite highly in, in, in all of the, of the models. And I should, I should sort of stress that you, there won't be much variation in terms of uh, uh, Applied service consumption, or rather, service proportion of demand for different services, because we assume um, the that uh, in the different in the different across the different uh, scenarios, uh, the unit energy uh, energy electricity consumption did not vary, um, and also we also didn't vary the um, we also didn't vary the market the stock of available appliances in the market that available to be sold. Um, we didn't vary that across the scenarios. Um, and so in, in the business as usual, if you look at per capita consumption for the residential sector alone, um, we see not much difference between the business as usual and the ambition scenarios where this is where um, this is the scenario that considers ambitious growth, early growth in the early years of um, um, Ethiopia's near future and the slowdown where there's quite a lot of uh, suppressed growth is it's not they don't develop as fast or as vicious as the government plans um and so in the ambition scenario by 2065 uh, uh again considering so in in this 
initial set of results, we assumed that the market, uh, a 2030 uh, minimum energy efficiency plan, uh, 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 minimum efficiency performance standards were implemented, were placed upon the market. And so by 2030, so gradually between 2017 and 2030, uh, inefficient appliances gradually were phased out. And so by 2030, um, there are more efficient appliances operating. It's, it's all more efficient appliances than there was in 2017. And so uh, 533 kilowatt hours. So this is just a little, a little lower than Brazil's per capita residential consumption uh, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so it, it just shows the kind of growth that the sector would have envisaged in that time where Ethiopia is today and where Brazil is today. Um, also, with, I guess, with some of the efficiency improvements that were received. Um, we also decided to, to compare uh, the energy electricity savings um, between if there were no changes in efficiency. So if the market stock of appliances that can be sold uh, remained throughout um, from 2017 remain throughout the Remy. horizon. Yes. Two, three minutes, please. Okay. Remain throughout the model horizon. Uh, then we we realized we checked that there'll be 33% savings available. Again, which doesn't differ much between the different scenarios because we assume the same markets uh, uh, appliances available. Um, then the we we compared our results with the plans that the Ethiopian Energy Authority have to increase efficiency um, in, 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 in the nation. Um, they have quite ambitious plans to uh, have minimum energy performance standards for lighting, uh, injury baking, and other cooking, which come in earlier. So 2025, 2026, and 2021, respectively. And so we find that with their targets, it's quite a quite a, a, a large number of savings available compared to what we had um, estimated with the 2020, 2030 performance targets. Um, but then in terms of their estimates, our, our model found that with injury baking, they had perhaps underestimated how much savings is possible uh, when the uh, with the with the performance targets that they have, with the timelines that they have, and perhaps in terms of other cooking, uh, there isn't as much, there may not be as much room for savings as they have anticipated. We didn't compare the lighting with ours because for them, lighting covers beyond the residential sector. Um, at the same time, we also looked at if what, what would happen if the uh, minimum energy performance standards were extended or rather they were not implemented as, a, as effective as they might want to. And so there were still some inefficient technologies in the market going beyond 2040. Uh, and we found that there wasn't that much change uh, by that sort of 10 to 20 year lag. There wasn't that much because again, 2013, 2014, not all appliances would have those strict timelines. Some of them would go beyond, but we found that there wasn't that much um, savings as compared to if there was no savings at all. So one insight there for policy is that it's, it's, it would be much better to implement these, uh, implement the, the, the minimum energy performance standards effectively as opposed to trying to rush the process too, too quickly. But at the same time, this is dependent on how early those changes begin to take place because in the 2040 um, minimum energy performance standards that we considered, uh, there's a reduction in inefficient appliances in the market already from the start year. So we would also want to run a scenario where those there are no changes delayed for quite some time. Um, so again, as, as would be expected, the faster um, Ethiopia grows, or rather the, the, the higher the growth they have over the, over the near future, over the future, the more important um, there would be to implement these efficiency standards and more savings available. Um, and so just some future research um, opportunities that we found from this, you can use to implement costs with available cost data, maybe some changes in, in terms of uh, uh, unit energy consumption and diffusion levels, but that would require quite a little bit of, of data and data availability um, to perform multi-country analyses and um, to consider other sectors, industry, commercial, small businesses, 
and also to expand uh, the model to other fuels. Um, other fuels are very important in Ethiopia's residential sector, and we didn't consider them in this to consider other income groups and behavior, for example, the process of energy stacking to see how that then impacts things, and also model integration. Uh, so in, in our model, we've, we've tried to integrate this analysis with the GIS, um, the geospatial electrification, low, low, least cost electrification planning um, analysis to try and find out uh, uh, how we can update those insights where they would otherwise be using um, less sophistication in terms of uh, the disaggregation of behavior amongst different income groups. So there's more room for that as well. So thank you. Okay, Femi, thank you very much. Uh, anybody wants to, to ask for any, anything, any question, please? Hey. Mantis has a question. Yes, uh, I have actually two questions. One is a very short one. Uh, I'm just interested why cooking and injera baking were modeled as separate demands. Uh, do we, uh, do in, uh, injera baking uh, need a specific equipment? Yes, it does. Okay, so, and the second question, uh, when you're using energy planning models, it's always uh, essential to get the data right. Well, uh, especially the initial data. So I'm really interested in how did you manage to get relatively detailed data, uh, especially considering uh, uh, the useful energy demands. In other words, services to be provided by the appliances, like uh, how, how much uh, service should be provided by TV, uh, refrigeration, and et cetera. Yes. Okay, so thanks, Mantas. Yes, I mean, so data is one area where we, there can always be more improvement. Um, so on initially, we, in terms of the proportion of, so this is not in you know, energy consumption, but in terms of the proportion of, of households that have availability for a particular service, um, luckily the um, World Bank's multi-tier uh, framework survey for Ethiopia had been con concluded in 2017. Um, so quite a lot of detailed data in terms of services that were available and in some cases, um, efficiency of appliances that were available uh, to households all across Ethiopia um, in the urban and disaggregated of the urban and, urban and rural areas. So that was quite helpful. Um, but in a lot of cases, especially also with the unit energy consumption, we had to try and uh, source data from a range of different uh, sources. Um, most of our sources were from the Ethiopian uh, Energy Authority. Uh, so they had, they had conducted some surveys recently um, outsourced to other organizations um, that provided some um, information on unit energy consumption um, for different appliances. Uh, and, then at this, and then in some cases we used sort of international estimates that were available in the literature. Okay, thank you for the answers and for the interesting presentation. Okay, the last one uh, question. We are uh, uh, on time, Jacqueline. Thank you um, for, the, for the really interesting presentation. Um, I um, wanted to pick up on the um, point in your methodology where you said that you might also include income groups um, in the future. And that was about the yeah about the future future research, um, because um, from um, I saw another presentation um, also during this conference where they um, talked about um, the influence of um, income and um, on of income on uh, the on the possibility of households to buy um, appliances, for example, so efficient um, appliances and how for some households there's this threshold of even um, using uh, electric appliances only if they have enough uh, money to afford that so i personally i i would i would guess i don't know if you have a feeling about this that also the distribution and future development of the distribution income groups might have a um, might really have an important influence on the way of how electric appliances um, are being used and are being bought I, I think you're absolutely right. That would have a 
big impact. Um, I guess this is the thing to do thing with bottom up um, energy demand modeling uh, specifically uh, because you're constrained by the data availability. Um, in order to be able to do that, you'd need detailed data that is available um, for this um, methodology specifically. You would need uh, detailed data in terms of uh, the diffusion of these, these services across the different income groups, which is not considered in the MTF survey. But at the same time, what you'd also need is secondary data, historical data, uh, whether time series data or cross panel, uh, uh, um, cross sectional panel data for other countries, maybe, or, or, or some history, historical data for Ethiopia to, to be able to use as, um, as a means of estimating what the potential pathway in the future might be. Um, and again, that is not necessarily um, disaggregated by income group. In some such situations, there are, they are. Um, but yes, it would, it would definitely be beneficial. Um, but just at, at, the, at the at first thinking, data is important, but there may be ways to tweak the methodology, for example, to be able to incorporate income where that disaggregation, because in some household surveys, uh, uh, appliances have been disaggregated by, by or rather appliance uptake and service uptake has been disaggregated by income, which um, could then could then make things possible. Okay, thank you very much, all the speakers. Uh, congratulations, and see you soon. Good luck uh, in your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Paco, thank for the lead. Thank you, Paco. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Maria. Ciao. Thank you. Congratulations. Bye. Bye. Thank you.